Hello everyone and welcome back to the Slow Car Salon, to what is now the 10th installment of the Celica 1UZ Swap series. And there's still plenty to do, so that's enough talk, let's get started. Now I'm coming back to the radiator and cooling area because I'm going to install the 12 inch Spall pusher fan. Very low profile unit, very high CFM. And this is gonna sit on front of the condenser and it's highly recommended if you're going to run AC for that extra cooling. Otherwise the two nine inch fans would suffice. So what I'm gonna to have to do here is, so I've already unbolted this upright here that sport that bridges the upper and lower radiator supports because it's already kind of a tight squeeze to get this in there with that upper support. But with it unbolted, I can slip it in there and I can add some sort of small spacer down there at that bottom bolt just so that everything fits up. I did have to uh, disconnect the condenser line that runs from this point here and then across the condenser and then in through the firewall at this point back in here. I don't know if you could see that easily because of the exposure levels, but I'll jack it up for you there in the editing so it's more clear. And yeah, that will help get this guy in and I can put it back in once it's installed. Okay, and that's the pusher fan mounted up very sturdily on all of the same derail uh, 13001 mounting pins that I used for the radiator. And yeah, this fits without any contact to the vertical support there. Thanks to the addition of some washers. I basically just glued a bunch of washers together uh, and got a slightly longer M6 bolt that spaced it out from the bottom just enough to allow clearance and absolutely no contact to the fan, so that's perfect. I also want to make mention of the fact that I did very quickly de-pin and re-pin this connector. The blue wires in black wire here are normally supposed to be uh, flip-flopped around this housing, but I swapped them because the fan motor needs to turn in the other direction. So this will ensure that my airflow is in, this cor in the correct direction. And of course, I have to find a spot to route this through perhaps up through here or maybe behind the headlight. Actually, behind the headlight makes more sense because then I can route that through and I have the little uh, spall uh, extension harness that I can plug into here. And then, as far as this condenser line, let's see, how is this going to work now? Okay, wait, this is supposed to go in this direction. No, wait. Which direction is this supposed to go in? All right, now that I've got that figured out, I bolted up the line here to the clamp and actually it will go and I go nicely over the fan in between the support and then out to where here, where the uh, dryer is supposed to go. So I think that should actually work out. Uh, of course, the dryer is not going to be actually installed until I plumb up the AC lines because there's no reason to open up the dryer because it is going to just accumulate moisture and be much less effective. So good to know because I can just leave this here for now and maybe just zip tie it or something and out of the way. And now we can come back to the radiator once more. But with that, I have something to show you. And here it is. This is a billet thermostat neck from Venom Automotive out of Australia. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece and well worth the money because the original plastic thermostat housings, as you can see, they age, they get brown and can eventually get very brittle and crack. Mine did not, which is very, very fortunate, but I figure while I'm here, I'll replace it. Now the Venom piece does come with two of its own bolts that are a little bit shallower because the flange is much thinner than the original piece. So we're gonna have to pull out the studs from the thermostat neck here before this can be installed. And there it is. It's a beautiful lifetime piece for the engine because you'll spend the money once and never have to replace it ever again. I kind of like the finish on it too because it very closely matches the wrinkle intake cover. So that's kind of a neat little extra feature. All right, with that done, I put the radiator back in just to show you guys a little something. So earlier on, I had mocked up the lower radiator hose down here uh, with the little one and a half inch elbow from Vibrant and I cut it to length to try to see how it would fit up. And yes, while it did mean I ended up cutting an elbow here, 
which is non, makes it a non-returnable part now. Uh, what I noticed is that for one, this CX Racing radiator, while the outlets on the motor are one and a half inch diameter, on the radiator they're one and three eighths inch. So unfortunately, unless you get some kind of sleeve or really try to clamp it down, it's just not gonna make a very confident seal, at least in my mind, because I really wanna make sure that those areas are sealed off. But then with the bottom especially, what was happening is because there's so little clearance between the sway bar mount bracket and the outlet, the silicone ended up being a little bit too thick for that application anyways. So what I'm going to do instead is actually, what I did is got this one and three eighths inch aluminum pipe, and I'm going to have that cut I'm gonna bead roll the end because I got the bead rolling tool and have just this welded on as the outlet instead. That way the outlet at least up here becomes you know vertical and I'll have the bead roll on there so then I can slip a pipe on there and create a really good seal. And then to make the connection to the one and a half inch lines, somebody on Instagram, I believe his handle was Celica 400. Thanks for reaching out and telling me about the supplier. I was able to get some silicone pipes from the supplier called Pegasus Racing. And they provide these uh, very minute changes in uh, inner diameter uh, silicone joiners, which is very, very convenient. One, is, uh, one end is one and three eighths, the other end is one and a half. That'll make a very nice connection between the radiator and the motor. Although I guess if in this case you don't have to try to get these little adapter pieces, you should probably try to find that same S13 SR20 swap radiator, but with one and a half inch outlet. So maybe CX Racing is not necessarily the person to go with. But anyways, I'm going to use this elbow, all they have is blue. I'm gonna use this elbow for the top radiator hose. And then I'll have an adapter in the middle for the coolant temperature uh, sensor that will control the fans. And then just that same vibrant elbow again into the outlet here and the inlet or maybe their inlet outlet vice versa. And then this guy will just be another you know, coupler aluminum pipe that goes down into my one and three eighths inch aluminum pipe that I'll have welded on down there. And between them will be this adapter to go from the one and three eighths to the one and a half inch. Okay, there's my upper radiator hose. A Little bit of a color discontinuity between the hoses, but Pegasus was out of stock on the black hose adapters. That's okay, it's all clamped in, just check fit. No uh, clearance issue between the engine and the pipe. And I was even able to package the uh, sensor in there for the uh, coolant temp sensor for the fans. So the fans kick on at 195, kick off at 175. Fits in there, no problem. Got the adapter in there, all clamped up. May not look the prettiest, but I wanted the hose uh, ends to be in a serviceable location with all the clamps. And then as I said, for the bottom radiator hose outlet, I'm gonna have to make a modification so that we can get the elbow welded to it. So next up, while it may seem like I'm skipping ahead a little bit, I actually wanna try to get the uh, Series 2 or rather 98 uh, Lexus LS400 overflow tank mounted up, as well as get the whole intake mounted up and the reason for that is because I want to make sure I'm package protected for whatever I do with the lower radiator hose routing, as well as making sure I can put my distribution post down here, or at least along the side of the chassis, because I still have not terminated my uh, battery cable from the battery relocation, so I wanted to make sure that I wasn't jumping ahead. So I'm going to try that out first. Uh, I'm going to get this uh, little, some kind of bracket made here so I can mount the other end of the overflow tank to the shock tower and then try to get the rest of the intake and the MAF sensor and the air box mounted. And I'm using an SC400 air box because they actually are very nice in that, well, for one, that they actually fit in this little space with a little bit of wire tucking. But if I ever want to change out the filter, it's just a simple matter of popping these clips, which ends up being a two-handed operation. But then you can lift up this door and then bang you got access to your filter. So it's a very, very nice part for serviceability compared to the LS400 piece. And I don't necessarily want to run open air filter just yet because 
things like that. The guys at the bar referee in California, they get spooked and scared. They don't know what it is. They don't understand it. And therefore, your car doesn't pass a, a bar referee test and won't smog. <laughs> Jokes aside, let's get this mounted up. See what has to happen back here in order for the airbox to fit. And get the math plumbed up and go from there. Well, that was a bit of an operation. So I ended up having to trim the snorkel and remove that bracket off the front of the SC400 airbox. Had to remove that bracket as well as that bracket because otherwise every part of that was contacting this little corner where I was trying to fit this SC400 airbox. I also had to kind of scoot some wiring out of the way to give myself even more room. And I finally was able to slot that in. Then had to slot the holes on the MAF in order to make the LS400 MAF fit on the SD400 airbox. And it still won't uh, give me enough clearance here. I'll show you real fast. And there, here, I mocked it back up again. And yeah, it's just so super tight to the intake pipe here. And I just can't tuck the intake box any further for, uh, forward in the engine bay here. I think what's uh, causing most of my issue is just kind of in this corner. Uh, the front of the air box, yeah, now is hitting the front of the um, radiator support here. When I scoot it all the way in, that is. And then, yeah, it's just not allowing any room in here to remove this. But uh, as far as the coupler is concerned, because we got to go from... Uh, Something like three and a quarter to three and a half inches. I can't even get the coupler in there because it's so darn tight. So I'll have to look into what I need to do to make that fit a little bit more properly. But at least I'm kind of going in the right direction over here. Uh, as far as the battery post, I think I'm gonna, just going to leave it in the same spot because then the uh, positioning is mostly unaffected by where that uh, coolant overflow bottle is going to go. So that's also good news. Okay, so it's been a little while and I've had a little bit of a rethink about how I want to go about trimming this airbox so it can fit in the corner of my engine bay. So after taking a look at what the air intake looks like with the filter in it, Well, after all that modification and trimming, the whole thing fits. I mean, just barely. We are still scraping out in the bottom here by the edge of the rad support. And, but I mean, hey, the whole bit of piping, everything fits. The coupler, MAF, or airflow meter in this case, the surge tank, the piping, it all fits. Although I did have to assemble the entire intake first and then couple it here to the throttle body. So you'll probably have to get your hose clamps and whatnot on here first though. And you can see even the coupler is still a little bit off kilter trying to get this in here straight. Uh, another thing I noticed is that the headlight relay here is not, I don't think is going to fit in this space anymore between the air box and the radiator. It's, well, maybe you can finagle in there, but it is going to be a very tight fit so I'll have to might have to relocate this or maybe trim some more plastic off this air box but I think that's as good as it's going to get for right now of course because I'm using an LS400 MAF or sorry airflow meter 
Again, on an SC400 air box, there are some modifications you have to make. I already mentioned having to drill out these holes here for the studs, but the studs on the air box have a little bit of an increase in diameter, so you will need to counterbore that in order to accommodate it, as well as put the gasket in. But I will say, the air filter is pretty well tucked away from all of the elements. I mean, I don't think there's a high danger of crud getting in between the air box and where it will be pulling air in behind the headlight. But I guess if that does become an issue after an inspection later down the road, I can always put some kind of mesh in front of the air filter so that at least larger particulates don't collect in front of the much finer air filter. So coming back to the air box here, I had some concerns about debris and other stuff getting in. So I figured what I could do is make a little plate that can cover up the hole that I cut after a little bit more cleaning up and straightening up some edges. I can make a little plate here that can fill this gap as well as provide a little suction hole like the stock piece had before. And I can achieve this with a piece of some ABS. This is 1 8 inch thick, uh, 12 inch by 12 inch ABS. One side is textured, the other side is not. You can get this really easily off Amazon. So what I'm going to end up doing is taking my cardboard model and cutting out a panel out of this stuff and then epoxying it into the air box. Okay, the epoxy has set, so now we can inspect the work. Uh, because of the way I cut this hole in the air box, it wasn't exactly straight, so there were some edges where I had to kind of double up on the epoxy to kind of set and uh, fill the gaps. So I would recommend if you were to cut your air box, uh, use a very stable uh, blade, or at least maybe even if you have access to one, a vertical bandsaw that you can just kind of run the air box through straight so you don't run into that problem. But otherwise, it's all ready to go. It looks really nice. I have a similarly sized opening for the filter, and this is ready to go back in. And there it is. Put the filter back in, connected it back to the throttle body. Uh, of course, I will get hose clamps for this uh, very soon, so those will go on as well. All right, and before moving on, I just got everything out of the way because there's a couple of things I need to do as far as adding some riv nuts here for the battery post and for mounting the coolant overflow, so I'm gonna get to that. Now that everything is mounted in here, I did want to address the coolant overflow because it is just sort of hanging in here via one bolt since we do need to support this end. So I ended up making a small bracket out of three quarter inch wide by one eighth inch thick aluminum, drilled out the bottom for an M8 bolt and put a hole in the top for a riv nut for an M6 bolt. And that's essentially just going to use this hole here, which I would have loved to have riv nutted, but I hadn't thought about that before the engine went in because there simply just isn't enough room uh, now that the engine is in here to put my riv nut tool in. So I'll just put a through bolt through here and that will go up uh, and support the overflow like so. And I'll run a bolt through it just like that. All right, now that that's done, I also just wanted to mention that I did, as you can see there, put a stack of washers in between uh, all super to glue together so at least I don't have a bunch of washers spilling out if I ever forget that there's a spacer in there. But I just put them in there because the bottom of the coolant uh, overflow reservoir here was hitting the metal of the engine base, so I just wanted to bump it up just a little bit. But that's now 
solidly mounted in. I guess I will route the overflow drain just to go down here. And then finally, I have to terminate my battery cable and I'm glad I didn't cut it when I first routed it because now I realize I'm just going to route it. You can see the wire sleeving down there. I just need to now turn the wire and then kind of run it up straight and underneath this section of the air box so that it comes up right to the battery distribution post. And there is the battery cable there, nicely terminated and attached to the distribution block, or distribution post, I should say. And everything's fitting up pretty nicely in this corner. Still got the circuit um, or main relay here. Uh, headlight relay is still tucked back there, just now rotated about 90 degrees so that it can fit within this space. And yeah, that pretty much rounds up this side. Now, coming back to the other side though, this is going to be the area where I put my remote mounted oil filter as well as perhaps a washer bottle. I'll probably tuck it in somewhere over here, but that will be to come. However, I did put the igniters over here just because there is just more room for it and trying to put it over here and next to the coolant overflow would have been just a little bit too, I guess, cozy for my liking. So I just put it over here, which does mean I will have to make a modification to the harness so that the cable or rather wires for it route across the firewall and then go here rather than, because I believe the wires for the igniters here, they also are bunched in together with the airflow meter. So those will have to be separated for this application. And after just a few minutes work, I've relocated and fully secured the igniters to this side of the car. All I did was just take the stock LS400 igniter bracket, bend and re-drill it a little bit, and now it's sitting nicely against the shock tower here, bolted in, also bolted in down here, so that it just overall occupies the same space where the old coil pack and igniter was for the 22RE. So next on the list is mounting up this guy, the remote oil filter. So what I'm going to do is make a bracket so I can mount it in this location here and kind of make it sit right above here, um, just above the battery tray floor right there. I'll make some kind of bracket that will triangulate it with this point here against these points on the side of the fender. And then down here, now because it's been so long since I last looked at the oil outlets, I made sure to write down which side was the outlet and which side was the inlet. And so the being that the outlet is on the left side, What's nice is that on the oil filter adapter here is that the left side fitting is the inlet for the filter. So thankfully, at least as a reference, what that's going to mean is that the lines will just go to like a, a straight shot. The left one will go to the left fitting, right side will go to the right fitting on the engine, and then the oil will flow correctly to the oil filter. So if you have your old oil filter housing that's meant to go on the engine, um, or at least make sure you hang on to that so you know what goes where because I ended up having to reach out to Blake Machine who made the adapter for the engine and they very kindly let me know which side was which. Anyways, let's get started making that bracket as well as making the lines to hook that guy up. All right, well that took a little bit of time to fabricate, but I'm really happy with the result and my remote oil filter is mounted up. Now, it is really tight here, the filter to these bolts here um, that bolted to the bracket that I had made, but overall, I mean, hey, it still works. I also made a bracket that was riveted to the back of this bracket that then, uh, if, you can, if I can try to rotate these fittings out of the way, that then uh, triangulates the bracket with this little hole in the uh, battery tray, like I said. So that's good. The only issue is that because of this bolt being a very 
fairly tall bolt is that I can't really rotate the fitting over because the oil filter uh, adapter here is very, very low and I didn't really want to mount it any higher. So there is that. So I may just get a lower profile bolt for this, but otherwise if I can sort of just orient these in generally the same direction, then they can go down and underneath the AC compressor to be connected to the oil filter adapter. All right, and with that, it's time to add in the oil lines and I'm going to make them right now. Let's add them in. Okay, wow, all right, there you go. Lines are in. I decided not to go through the process of showing you how to make these because if you go back to episode seven, then you'll see how I went about making these. So those are all routed down. They go into the oil uh, filter adapter down there, hook up to the oil filter, uh, remote oil filter housing here, and it's all fitted up very nicely, all tightened down. So that is a good install. I'll put some hose separators on it a little bit later just to clean things up. But I will say what really helped is getting the while rather pricey, uh, vibrant performance uh, AN fitting wrench. It is a little thick in some ways, uh, just around the edges, but that makes it for, I guess, a stronger piece. So it does make things harder, like when it comes to the fittings that are like right next to each other, like they are on the oil filter housing here. But otherwise, you can just use a regular crescent with some electrical tape on it so you don't mar your fittings. Next up, I'm going to move on to the catch can. Now this is a unit I got online from AdW1 and I went through a couple of different units and looking up stuff online and I finally came to this because of its design with the flat top and the ports coming out from the sides as well as the fact that it looks really nice. They give you uh, anodized hardware for a variety of colors, this little ring as well as hose clamps if you need in both 3 8 and 5 8 inch sizes. It has a little dipstick here on the top. Uh, the fittings are also 3 8 and 5 8 inch, and the mount on top can be clocked in any which way you want up top, which is very nice. But most importantly, it has a baffle in the bottom already, so that's really nice. No need to use any kitchen uh, stainless steel sponge or anything else like that, because I think that will do the job. So that is super nice and convenient. And it's compact size means I can position it in a variety of locations. I think though that I'm going to end up putting it about here, a little lower than the top of the shock tower because I wanna leave my options open when it comes to positioning the cruise control module. May put it on the stock bracket over here, may put it over here, just depends on what I need to do over there at the throttle body. But that's where I'm going to mount it. However, I did end up getting a right angle riv nut tool, so I'll be able to get in there in these tighter spaces in between the engine and the shock tower and things like that, so I can add riv nuts where necessary. And with that in mind, I can actually go back over to the bracket I made for the coolant overflow here and add a riv nut here to the shock tower so I can secure it without having to use a bolt through the entire fender well there. All right, well the catch can is now installed. I will say it was really tight down here. Not super happy with uh, the lack of space and ended up scratching parts of the engine bay and even my valve cover here with the riv nut tool, but it was as tight as could be. I could probably touch that up later if necessary, but the can itself mounted very nicely. I will note real quick though, I had to drill the post here, the shock tower, from the back and then rib nut it from the other side. And that made things a lot easier just as far as drilling is concerned. But anyways, the mounting, everything was real nice. Added an additional uh, vibrant hose clamp here to make things extra neat. The inlet goes to the PCV and the outlet right here runs all the way up and then into the PCV inlet here, which is now going to be breathing fresh and clean air. So that's really nice.
Okay, so I want to take a look at the radiator again. Since I brought up previously that I had some issues with some clearance from the lower radiator outlet to the sway bar bracket, I thought of a couple of things that I could compound to help with the clearance as well as the sway bar clearance issue to the frame from before as well. Uh, I also accidentally broke the overflow nipple here as I was trying to take it off to understand what the thread size was to then put a different nipple on it if such a thing was available. But I'll just get that welded on with a little 3 8 inch uh, outlet here later anyway, or 10 millimeter since the inlet here for the overflow is um, also 10 millimeter or, or so. And then it kind of goes into some funky metric size. So make sure you keep the stock hose on your overflow, by the way. So we're going to look at that and... Coming down here, what I'm going to do for spacing the sway bar is uh, first I can offset the mounts here. Uh, they're bolted straight into like these flat parts of the frame and I figured, okay, well, I can get a one inch spacer or something like that and put it in between. So for that, I just have a standard one inch uh, steel bar and I'll cut and drill it to the exact sizes I need. Uh, essentially just make a couple pieces. Uh, for either side, one, two, and then same for the other. That'll bring the whole sway bar bracket down an inch, still uh, within clearance of the oil pan. And then uh, that'll also bring the uh, tie rod ends or tension control rods here down as well. But then to further help space the sway bar from the frame, I'm going to get rid of the white line end links here and put in some of my own design. These I just made from a 3 8 24 bolt, some of the bushings and washers from my old energy suspension sway bar end links, and then a rod end that I got from McMaster that has the 3 8 24 thread. So yeah, these are significantly shorter than these pieces, and I can similarly just put a bolt right through them, and that will hopefully bring the sway bar down as far as I possibly can. That way I have clearance, not only for the radiator, but also for the frame. And then once that's done, then I can go in and make my lower radiator hose in there, and finally make that connection from down there, up along the side of the motor, and to the thermostat housing here. So let's get started on that. All right, after a little bit of faff trying to get the spacers in either side here and get the sway bar brackets bolted up, I was able to test out and make sure that the sway bar wasn't going to hit or do anything weird. And I am still getting a little bit of a clearance issue with the sway bar against the original and like the actual sheet metal mount. But in terms of the actual now range of motion that I have with the sway bar, it's, I have so much more now having spaced it down an inch. So I think this was the right move. And now that I'm going to have my shortened sway bar end links in there, I should be in good shape considering the range of motion of the suspension. Later on too, I'll make sure I take these out and make any adjustments to the holes and, uh, and get, get them painted up so they don't rust. But yeah, check this out. This is so much better than before as far as motion for the sway bar. I think, yeah, we should be in good shape here. Okay, so next I'm going to make the lower radiator hose. Now, I've actually gone ahead and put in this power steering pump. This is off of an SC400, and first things first, I am not using it as a power steering pump. I don't have power steering, therefore I don't actually need this to function as a pump. I just need it to be an idler so I can properly route the belt through the tensioner. I'm going to get a 5 8 cap here and just fill it with fluid just so that the bearing or whatever else inside doesn't run dry, because on the outlet here, instead of the banjo bolt, all I've done is just get an M60 by 1.5 bolt, cut it down to where I have about like 10 millimeters worth of thread, and add a copper crush washer in there so that the output doesn't actually 
I'll put any fluid because I just need it to be an idler. But I'm going to put it in there just to make sure that when the radiator's in, I can get a good understanding of how I need to route the hose and make sure that it won't hit this pulley. And making sure that I won't hit this guy means that my billet solution that's going to come along later isn't going to cause problems later down the road as far as clearance is concerned. Now I've also just gone and thrown in the belt real fast because I just noticed with the thermostat outlet here, it gets really, really close to the belt. So I want to make sure that when I'm making the hose, I'm well clear of that. Although when the billet solution for this little idler here comes in, the pulley will match the size of this idler here. So it is going to lower the whole affair to make sure that I have a little bit more clearance. But just to be on the safer side, I'm going to make sure that the hose clears up here as well as any other stuff over on this side. Okay, that was quite a little bit of fiddling around without really getting too far, but it did teach me a couple of things. One is that this space that I have to route the lower radiator hose through is really tight. It is no joke, really tight through there between the radiator and that lower radiator outlet. So unfortunately, I don't have enough parts within my repertoire to be able to create something uh, from here, I do have this one and a half inch aluminum pipe, which I can use to connect, say, this 45 degree bend to the one and three eighths to one and a half inch uh, blue elbow there that's on the radiator. And then I can probably couple that with the aluminum pipe to there, like so. If I can align it. There we go. And then probably shorten that end. But then I essentially now I have just a 90 degree to make from here to here. Of course, that's gonna, if that's a little shorter, then I can make a more tight uh, 90 degree turn there with like an aluminum elbow. And then this pipe here is just an off cut from this general uh, Gates hose, which actually, funny enough, the other end of that can be used to make your upper radiator hose uh, granted, you're not going to add a coolant uh, temp sensor for your fans if you're not going to run an e-fan that's run off of this sensor here. Uh, but if you're just like a regular, or you could probably even take this and find this coupler here, one and a half inch OD coupler that you can put your fan temp sensor into and then run this. So kind of nice that I had an off cut from that, but... Yeah, that's, that's, this is what I'm going to use. It's, it is hitting the radiator right here, but it is hitting against the aluminum strips that I put in order to mount the fans. So at least I'm not in too bad shape here. Um, like I said, I'll have to get a couple more parts in order to finish this, so I'll come back to it. And let me know your thoughts about the method I'm using to use the power steering pump as an idler. I'm just plugging it off. I'm not gutting it or anything. Should I gut it? Loop the lines? Both? Either? And your thoughts on the modification I'm doing down here for the sway bar. I am spacing down just the sway bar and tension control rod mounts, but is that going to affect my geometry highly? I don't seem to think so, but if you think so, let me know your thoughts and why. And that's it for this episode. A lot of work done and still plenty more to get done from here on. I know this video took a little while to come out, so much so that a face decoration appeared here, but that's how it is sometimes, life gets in the way. But the next video is going to be extremely important because without this, the car simply won't run. Can you guess what it is? At all? Anyways, hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one.